Good morning. Please stand with us. Worship with us this morning. Here we go. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold. Pure gold. Refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be. announcements actually and uh, first of all I just want to welcome you beautiful beautiful to see you beautiful sun coming in a time to worship and glorify together so thank you to everyone who contributed a hygiene kit so there's a bunch back there and we thank you for that and we thank you also any who donated to our food bank we want to make sure that we continue to help out others that need it in this time. We may be uh, having to be socially distanced in that, but we can still help out in a lot of different ways. I want to just continue in worship this morning. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've already had to, um, I've already had to have a, a talk with the Lord and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I've had to do that a number of times this morning. It just, it, it just was one of those mornings. And um, so just thinking about baptism, which we're so excited, I came to this psalm that I have had to read many, many times. So I just want to read some of it to you. Psalm 51, pr a prayer for restoration. Be gracious to me, God. According to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, 
blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have crushed rejoice. And then down into verse 10, very familiar. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. Father God, I just pray these words again. I don't pray them lightly. You know the very depths of our hearts. You know what we've come from this morning. Lord, you know um, how easy it is to be distracted. You know how easy it is to listen to lies from the enemy. Lord, we want to open up our hearts this morning to your cleansing, to your restoration, your redemption, as only you can. Please accept us humbly, messy, broken. Lord, we come to you. Create in us a clean heart. Oh, God. Amen. Please stand, and we'll continue in this worship. And 
to Jesus. Take a moment just now. What do you need to surrender? I know what I have to. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning we have um, a number of prayer requests, as uh, we just noticed over the past three weeks. 
that uh, there just are a, sort of a wave and a surge of prayer, so prayer requests. So do just continue to be in prayer for our congregation as you know we walk through um, meeting people's needs, lifting people up in prayer. There's been a lot of people who currently just lost someone or are in the midst of grief and pain. We think, we think of Gloria and Gloria Thomas and the family as they just mourn the loss of her mom and uh, the siblings and the whole family. So we just want to continue to lift them up along with Jan Eves as she's giving support to her sister uh, with the sudden loss of her son. As well as the uh, Boswick family, that is um, Brian uh, was the father-in-law to Randy and Judy. Their son has uh, passed away from a long battle with cancer. So, you know, there's people who are going through grief right now and pain, and we want to remember them, and they're mourning, and as they uh, work through uh, this time in their life, but we're also lifting up people who uh, are just, you know, in need of a prayer for healing. We think of Tracy, uh, we think of Edna McCutcheon, we think of Randy, um, and we think of Marissa Gundert, we think of Greg Fiddler, um, you know, maybe... May not everyone might not know him, but was a long-standing member a while ago. Maybe even had uh, done some work with our youth here, and he's battling now stage four cancer. So, yeah, him along with uh, James, a teenager that attends our youth group uh, week to week, and a snowboarding accident and some broken bones. So, you know, all together we do see just a number, uh, a surge of uh, just prayer requests within our congregation. So let's be continuing to keep up with our weekly emails that outline all of our different prayer requests, uh, being prayer for them and lifting them up at this time. And we want to continue just to pray for our community at large as we continue to navigate through this pandemic. So let's just spend some moments and lift uh, these people up in prayer. Let's unite our hearts. Father God, we do come before you and we acknowledge that we are people in need and we're just so thankful that you have a heart to give. You have a heart to meet our needs. You care about us. You ask us to patiently come before you with our requests to continually and persevere um, come before you with uh, what we need. Our need for daily bread Father, we think of those during this pandemic who have lost jobs for there's been a reduction in their income. We think of those who are not able to see family members and friends and are experiencing isolation. Father, we just pray that you put their names on our hearts. I might call them and take some time out of our day to see how they're doing. Father, we think of uh, those who just face uncertain times. Father, we think of our, those in our congregation who now are going through the difficult process of mourning and grieving. We think of those who have lost loved ones. We think of those who have said goodbye. Father, we pray right now that for the four or five uh, families within our congregation that are going through that, we pray that you'd flood their hearts and minds with all the wonderful memories. We thank you, Father, that you gave us these loved ones and we thank you, Father, that we built memories together, that we were able to spend time with them. And we thank you, Father, that uh, maybe we had a chance to say goodbye. And Father, we pray that uh, you give us that strength and that courage to know uh, that life does continue on, that we can still uh, stand and uh, still create great memories, even though uh, our loved ones are with you. May that hope uh, ring true and deep within our souls in a time of loss, to know that our loved ones are with you, that there will be a time of a reunion to come. Uh, and Father, help us to live uh, in the shadow of their strength and in their faith that we might carry it on. Father, we think of those who need your physician-like touch. Father, we think of Tracy and Edna, we think of Marissa, we think of Greg, we think of um, Eileen Rogers too, just coming to mind, Darwin's uh, mother-in-law, who's in hospital too. Father, just we just pray that your physician-like hand would be real and that your, your healing touch would be like a testimony. But Father, we also pray for their faith. May you increase their faith at this time too. May they know that you are still walking beside them. May they know that all things work towards something good. May they know that there are important lessons that can be learned in this time, that they can shape the heart as they wait patiently for healing and for a time when their body is restored. Father, I pray for comfort. I pray that uh, those who are involved in these different situations would 
continue to just give sacrificially and would lift them up in prayer. I pray, pray, Father, that we as a congregation would continue to, on a daily basis, just seek out time when we can pray for each other, even if it's just for a single other person. Father, we give to you all of our prayer requests. We lay them down at your feet. Father, we know that it is your Holy Spirit that empowers us to do mighty works. We know that it is your power that can reach down to heal. But Father, it's also through the power of your Holy Spirit for us to be able to have that faith and that hope and that courage to continue moving forward and, and have hope for tomorrow, even when times are tough. But Father, we do look around and we think of all the blessings that we do have. We look around, we look around to just praise you for our time here together, for the fact that we can still communicate with those who are at home. We thank you, Father, that uh, you continue to guide us and you continue to show us a path and a way forward. Father, we think of all those during this time of Easter and during this time of pandemic who just have sought your face. For those who a time of pandemic has made them question their own mortality, their own soul. For those who have wondered about who you are. For those who maybe clicked on a video to learn more about you and to learn about the name of Jesus. Father, that is happening everywhere at this time. And we thank you for that. We pray, Father, that that curiosity, which is led by the Holy Spirit, would bring them to bending their knee and to submitting to your authority and to committing their life to you. Father, we thank you that this morning we get a demonstration of that as uh, Dieter comes forward to be baptized, a symbol of his commitment to your son. We pray that more would come forward in this time. We pray that, Father, there'd be a great harvest amongst our land, amongst our communities, and our family, even within our own hearts, that we would all be transformed through this time. And Father, we thank you that even though we walk through this time of pandemic, life does continue on. And even with what seems like sometimes compounding problems, you are there, you are our shepherd, you walk with us, you never leave us or forsake us, you are teaching us, you are guiding us, you are equipping us. You are transforming, you are molding our hearts. We acknowledge that you are the potter and we are the clay. We think of uh, all those who need that shaping and that molding. All, all those prayer requests this morning that are unspoken, that are within our hearts as we wrestle, as we walk through our daily life. Sometimes what we struggle with isn't seen. And we pray for all those who behind their houses and closed doors struggle with feelings of fear and pain and hurt and anger, temptation. I pray, pray, Father, that through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the, the power of the gospel that they would overcome, they would see hope, be connected with you in such a deep and transformative way. Father, this is a time when we remember how much you love us as shown by this great sacrifice. You did not even spare your own son that we might be saved, that we might be able to be reconciled to you, that we might know you in a deep and intimate and personal way. That your love was satisfied on that day when you gave. And we celebrate your victory. We celebrate the establishment of your church on that day. That it goes further than just our ethnicity, but it goes to all those who have a change of heart. Father, how your church is a global movement changing all of humanity. You did it all through what was just a carpenter's son because of the mighty power that was within him, because of who he was and what he did. We pray, Father, that uh, that story of Jesus laying down his life and overcoming the grave on resurrection would just resonate deeply with us, that we might be changed and transformed, that we might bring that message forward like the apostles did, like all of those who were close to him, like the women did who found an empty grave and ran shouting, we pray, Father, for an experience like that where we would be willing to share, that we'd be on fire for you, that we would give our whole selves over to you. Father, we just continue to lift up your praises as we now turn to your word, as we now put under a microscope these last moments, these last major moments in your life before uh, you gave everything. We pray, Father, that uh, your word would just transform us again this morning. Open our hearts. Help us to see what we're supposed to learn. We thank you that your Holy Spirit does that. That it's not just a single individual teaching us, but that your Spirit teaches all of us. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning uh, we're going to open up and uh, we're going to be walking through um, the next few weeks looking at some of the Stations of the Cross. The, uh, the Stations of the Cross um, has been a tradition in the Christian world for a long-standing time. It has a few different variations. It's observed a little more piously in the Catholic and Orthodox and Anglican traditions, but it's powerful enough that it has certainly made its way uh, in, in every denomination in some way. It's a way for us to journey through some of the most crucial and interesting and profound and powerful moments of Christ's passion, these last moments uh, before his crucifixion. And what happened in those moments has been put under such a microscope. Like, you just have to be, just be remembered that some of that Old Testament, some of the Old Testament, you know, it sweeps decades of history in a single sentence. And it can talk about an entire generation of people in just a paragraph. And yet, the Stations of the Cross put these moments of Jesus' life under a microscope. For us to really see some unbelievable moments where Christ gave and tried to redeem and give to all that, would he, that encountered him and saw him and witnessed this. And because of that, we can be transformed and we can learn. The Stations of the Cross help us recognize what Jesus endured so that we will not just understand as to understand information, but that we would respond we would respond with our own lives like the centurion, the soldier who saw this anew and knelt his knee before him. The scriptural significance of the stations of the cross is to detail the path Jesus walked on his way to eventual redemption of humanity. And that's really important that this wasn't just a good man we ought to remember because of what he endured, but rather there was a mission and a much larger purpose behind what he did on that day. That the purpose was leading towards redemption. It was leading towards something that would save all humanity and establish his church for us, where we sit today uh, in the sense of the people giving their lives to Christ. That movement started then, and now we still see the fruits of that to this day. Today we're going to be looking at Jesus accepting his cross. Today we're going to be looking at narrative. We're going to be looking at the story of the events that unfolded. And we have to ask ourselves the question as we walk through this, why did John, we'll be looking at the Gospel of John, why did he compose his story in this way? Why did he highlight the details that were highlighted? There was so much going on. This is a city, urban center. This was a, a really tumultuous and violent and critical time. Why did he highlight what he highlighted? And of course, the question for us is, what can we learn? How can we respond? What is John trying to teach us about the way he composed the series of events that he did? So we're going to be reading from John chapter 19. And uh, I'll be walking through uh, verses 4 through to uh, 16. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and other officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate said, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power to either free you or to crucify you? 
Jesus answered, You would have no power over, over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate said? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So like I said, this isn't maybe, this uh, piece of scripture is not necessarily like Paul where we're getting a lot of instruction and reflection. Now, maybe not like an Old Testament prophet who's giving the people instruction to turn from their ways or to tell them about something coming. This is story and this is narrative and we're trying to glean what is John trying to teach us or what can we learn as John puts together these facts of Jesus' trial before Pilate. You know, John goes to great lengths to highlight a certain series of events. Let's not forget that just before verse 4 here where we started, Jesus was brought before Pilate and Pilate had him flogged. And after the flogging and after the soldiers mock him and put the purple robe on him. Then verse 4 picks up and once more he came before Pilate. So this is the whole scenario that is playing out before Pilate and the crowd. We talked about how, so John highlights the flogging, the mocking, but Pilate comes before the crowd to say, I find no fault against him, yet Jesus paid the price of someone who was, supposed, was found guilty. The crowd then shouts, crucify them, crucify him, even though he has paid a price for a crime he has not committed. Pilate hands an innocent man over to an angry mob instead of protecting an innocent man. Pilate makes a commitment to try and save Jesus, to keep Jesus free. But in verse, in verse 12, he makes that commitment, but the crowd intimidated Pilate by questioning his own allegiance. The Jewish crowd compromises their own faith by pledging allegiance to Caesar so that this man, Jesus, would be crucified. You know, this is a story where John is going to such lengths to highlight, you know, every bit of wrong turn and every bit of wrong human behavior there is. Injustice. Cruelty. Jesus had been flogged, he'd been whipped, and yet they still want more. Compromise, as, as Pilate knows he's an innocent man, but yet is still willing to hand him over. Betrayal. John is highlighting every bit of wrong behavior that us humans are guilty of in many times in our life. You know, what is John highlighting here? He certainly seems to be focusing on the effects of sin. Jesus is allowing himself to endure the effects of the sin that's within all of our hearts so that we might know how ugly and cruel it is. See, this moment just seems so even unusually evil. This moment seems so even unusually callous. You know, sometimes we forget about the spiritual battle that was going on during the Passion Week. Jesus' final week before crucifixion. One of my favorite authors is quick to um, recognize and remind us that as Jesus gets closer to Jerusalem, as he enters the city and as he walks towards his crucifixion, notice that evil seems to really, is a, evil is really aroused. There's just more and more evil as he gets closer and closer to what is good and what is right. We can't forget about the spiritual battle that's going on. So John intentionally highlights Pilate, uh, Pilate's phrase when he brings Jesus out before the crowd. And Caesar says to the crowd, here is the man. 
That's a really profound statement when he says that. He says, look at this human body. Look what has happened to him already. At this moment, Jesus would have been so, his body would have been so horribly disfigured. The sight of him having been beaten with robes placed on him, a crown of thorns on his head, having been struck and spat on, it would have been more than what we could have to bear. And when Caesar brings him out to say, this is the man, we are taught something spiritual. That what has happened to Jesus' physical body is a symbol of what happens to our soul and our spirit because of sin. What sin does to our spirit is seen in what has happened to Jesus' human body. Because after all, let's not forget that this humiliation and torture was a product of people's corrupt sin. People's corrupt spirit, I should say. People's corrupt spirit. It reminds me so well and so vividly it connects with the prophecies that were foretold of Jesus ahead of time. Isaiah 53, uh, the whole chapter is just one of the most epic uh, you know, prophecies of Christ to come and the markers of the Messiah. And in verse 6 of chapter 53 in Isaiah we read, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has set on him the iniquity, set on him the iniquity of us all. You know, Jesus bore that iniquity, that wrong, that is so true of all humans. We are all capable of such evils. And in that moment when we turn to our own, when we turn our own way, just as the crowd does, when we turn our own way, that corrupts our spirit. And that sin does to our soul what happens to Jesus physically. Even Isaiah recognizes that turning our own way has these consequences. And is foretold that our turning away, the soldiers turning away, the crowds turning away, pilots turning away, would set on Jesus the iniquity of this situation. And Jesus has to bear that. And of course, um, you know, it's, it's visible. Verse 7 goes on to say, uh, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Just amazing to think of Jesus' fulfillment of that prophecy when Pilate asks him, where do you come from? And Jesus doesn't answer. It's a fulfillment of verse 7, that yet he did not open his mouth. So Isaiah sees this and recognizes that the Messiah would be one who would bear the sin and the weight and the consequences of those who would turn away. And this is where we can really begin to open up and ask the question, well, well, then what about me? What about myself? How can I respond to this? You know, I don't want the consequences of my own sin to be so tragic, to have such a consequence as to bear pain on a Messiah. You know, I think we're supposed to respond to this story with a desire to deal with our own evil. That we have to recognize that within this crowd could have been us. Within that crowd, would we have participated if we didn't check or we hadn't yet dealt with our own sin? It's a call on all of us to turn and to look towards a Savior. And I think that's what John is trying to highlight for all of us, that we all have a need to turn. We all have a need to turn towards a Savior We all have corrupt habits. We all have shortcomings. We were all capable of doing to Jesus what happened on that day. It wasn't just them. Perhaps it was all of us. And there's a need for all of us to turn. See, remember, Jesus reveals to Pilate who he should really fear in life because Pilate's actions show who he actually feared. See, Pilate was really just trying to appease the crowd so they would all just go away. He didn't want this crowd before him. He didn't want to deal with this problem. And so what does he do? He tries to appease them. First, by punishing Jesus, he thinks, well, if one man has to pay a price so this whole crowd goes away and this whole, you know, this whole mess, this whole situation just goes away, maybe all right. But that doesn't seem to work. They want more. 
And then when the crowd questions Pilate's uh, loyalty by saying that, you know, maybe he's not as loyal to Caesar as he thought he was, Pilate gives in to that peer pressure and hands him over to be crucified. Yet Jesus says to Pilate that he would not have power over him if it not were given to him from above. It reminds us who we ought to really fear and who we ought to turn to. The Stations of the Cross of Jesus' last moments is a, larger, is a part of a larger journey to redeeming all of humanity. Jesus speaks truth to power in this moment when he says to Pilate that God gave you this power. And he's pleading with Pilate to turn, to not fear the crowd, to not give in to that, to that human emotion of peer pressure. Don't give in to that, but rather fear God. Rather, turn and let him be the one that influences you, not the peer pressure that you face. But we know he doesn't. And when he comes before the crowd in a disfigured way, having been a victim of all this violence, I think he's hoping that they'll have compassion. I think he's hoping that they'll look and they'll see what they've done. And they'll say, what have we done? Look how well, look at we've done to someone who is going to serve us and set us free but of course they don't. God, is, Jesus in this moment is pleading for everyone to turn. He's pleading for everyone to turn from their sins and turn towards God as he asks Pilate. I mean, if he had just gotten Pilate, maybe the crowd was lost, but if he had just gotten Pilate to turn, the situation may have been saved. See, Pilate had the power to walk out to that crowd and said, this is an innocent man. I'm not doing this. We are not doing this. Everyone go home or there's going to be real trouble. But no, he allows it to influence his decision. And so too, when we take away from this, from this scenario, it's just the need and the desire to recognize for all of us how we all need to turn. You know, as I kind of uh, conclude this station, as I can kind of conclude this, I'm, I look down Isaiah chapter 53 as I reference back to that. You know, we looked at verse 6 and 7, but verse 8 is really interesting, and it's possibly a, a great conclusion. It's a great response for all of us today. Verse 8 says this, uh, By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? You know, if we were there, what would we have done? And... This, Isaiah's heart is to, you know, he brings forward a really good point, right? He brings forward a really good point. Would we have protested, are we different than everyone else? Have we turned, you know, have our hearts turned that we would be different in that moment? It's a great call for all of us to think about, how do I respond to this story that John highlights about Jesus' trial? And this is something we can take away. Would we have protested? In the, just in the sense that would we have been different than the rest of the crowd? Would we have been able to recognize mob mentality? Which, by the way, apparently is one of the most difficult things for humans to do, is to recognize mob mentality and to separate yourself away from it. Mob mentality is a real, a real thing that humans succumb to all the time. And, you know, compromise and peer pressure, these are really difficult things. Would we have been ones who protested? Would we have said, no, this isn't right? That's a great question for us to maybe take away from this story. You know, what, what role would we have played in this moment? Would we have been able to? Would we have the strength? Has God transformed and changed our heart in this moment that we would be able to protest? You know, like, like Pilate as well, would we have recognized that we were fearing the crowd, which we should never fear. We were giving into peer pressure. We were, think we were self-interested. Certainly for Pilate, if word had gotten to Caesar that there was some sort of, if someone had gotten the news back to him that there was an insurrection, that Pilate wasn't loyal, that he didn't fulfill his duties, that would have meant his life, his job, his livelihood, everything. Yet it was the wrong thing to do to give in to that peer pressure, wasn't it? And so this, you know, what Isaiah says here in verse 8, yet who in his generation protested is maybe the takeaway and the response that we need to think about in our hearts as well. As we walk through the stations of the cross, we're not just um, taking in information, 
but we're trying to encounter something so powerful that it causes us to respond and be moved and to ask ourselves that same question. Would we have protested? Have we gone from just hearing information to making it personal, to making it something that I would do, something that has changed and shaped my heart? I think that's what Isaiah is asking. You know, it's amazing to think he used these words, you know, just, you know, how many centuries before Christ actually walked. And for the people at that time, yeah, it was very relevant too, because who was protesting all the idolatry and all the corruption of the people of Israel at that time, which eventually led to exile? Who was protesting back then? You know, who were the different, who were the people whose hearts were changed and were different and were walking a different path? And I think this story from John really illustrates that as well. It's a good takeaway for us. And you know what? I'm so excited this morning that we can celebrate someone from our own congregation who has uh, made that change and wants to come forward to make a public declaration that he will be one who tries to protest. He will be one who tries every day to commit his life to Christ. I'm so um, just pleased that we can call Dieter to come forward in just a, just a minute, but evidence of people who will turn their hearts and people of evidence of people who will give their life to Christ. Maybe we would be the ones to protest. Maybe the ones who have a changed heart. Because we can see the destructive behavior, the destructive consequences of what sin does as marked on our Savior. Just before I uh, um, call Dieter to come forward and share his testimony, let's just close uh, in a word of prayer. Father God, we do just come before you to acknowledge that you aren't uh, a bully who just wants everyone to play by your rules, but rather you warn us that some of our destructive habits and choices are really real and they really have consequences and we can see them as marked on the body of our Savior. Father, I pray that uh, each one of us would take to heart, you know, what we're supposed to learn from this story, that there is something within us that needs to be changed. You know, we don't want to be like the crowd that would hurt the one that came to serve them, and we don't want to be like Pilate that gives in to peer pressure. Father, we can see how, you know, selfish behaviors really cause destructive consequences. Father, help all of us to just recognize those habits in our own life. Help us to recognize where we fall short. Help us to recognize where we need you and where we can change our lives. Father, your spirit is one that convicts. It is one that shows us our sin. And I just pray, Father, that uh, right now in this moment, maybe there is something in our lives that needs to go, that needs to be laid down, and Father, we're just so thankful for a time of Lent, where a time of purification where we do that. Father, I'm just going to just offer up a couple of moments of silence, each of us, a moment to confess, a moment to ask for truth and clarity, and a time, again, to repent. Father, hear our prayers and enable us and empower us to make the changes that uh, we need in our life. And we're just so thankful, Father, to call Dieter forward this morning that he can share his testimony and he can make a symbolic commitment to following your son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, yeah, we're just so excited. Dieter, why don't you come forward to share your testimony? tell you, normally I walk around on the stage and uh, I had to be really careful about my steps this morning. <laughs> okay, Dieter, why don't you share your testimony with us? Yeah, I think I have my glasses. Good morning.
morning, everyone. Well, my testimony, my life is rather boring. And I don't have a big story to tell you. I never was into drugs or criminal activity. And I did not have a big aha moment either. Growing up in Germany as a Roman Catholic, and yeah, there is no bingo in the basement. <laughs> I learned about Jesus in school and attended church regularly. I even was an altar boy until I started to work. For many years, I was absent from church and religion until I met my wife, Joanne. She is the daughter of a pastor, and many of her uncles are pastors, too. So religion became part of my life, of my new life. With age, I was 50 at that time. You get a different perspective on life and religion, and they gain a deeper understanding how much God is in control. Looking back at my life, I realized how much God and his guidance has done for me over the years. I was not even looking at him, but he took care of me. He was there for me in many situations of my 35 plus years of traveling the world for business. With all this came the desire to learn more read the Bible, become the man God wants me to be. I'm still far away from being there, but one step at a time will get me closer and closer, so I hope. I do have my intimate time with the Lord every day, and I see him as my father. God is good, and his love for his creation is unconditional. We all have a place in his plan even if we don't see it. I try to live like Jesus is standing beside me, and this is what I try to do every day. Thank you. We all agree that baptism itself does not save us, but it is a symbol of our commitment to Christ. It is a testimony for Christ by those who observe it, and Christ himself has ordained the practice. Let's pray for Dieter. Father, we're so thankful for one who was made in your image and likeness, who said that he would turn and that he would commit himself to your son. We pray, Father, that you would continue to grow Dieter's faith as he's made uh, so aware to us this, this morning. He knows he's not a perfect man, but Father, he wants every day to just uh, give his yes to your son. I pray for him and Joanne and their marriage. Pray for his journey. Pray, Father, that you would continue to grow what you have already started. Father, we thank you. We know that Christ is the one who planted a seed of faith in Dieter, the one who will grow it, and the one who will perfect it as well. We pray for that journey of perfection. Keep him close. Walk beside him. Help him to know that every day you are there. Father, we pray that his life would be a testimony to others and that uh, he might be able to look back on these years and just see your faithfulness, be able to see the work that you've done in his life, Father, we pray that uh, you would uh, bless him in this journey. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now, here at the mission, just before we uh, baptize Dieter, just don't forget that after we baptize him, we traditionally yell, Hallelujah, praise the Lord.
Wonderful. Lots to praise him about this morning. So as we conclude, we're going to do this song. I'll ask that you still just reflect in this time. And I will actually call you in a little bit later uh, where you can join us as well. Our scars are a sign of grace in our lives and father how you brought us through when deep were the woods and dark was the night the promise of your love you proved now every battle still to come let this be our song it is well, it is well with, my soul. with my soul. It is well, it is well with my But joy will paint the morning sky. You're there in the fast. You're there in the feast. Your faithfulness will always shine. Now every battle still to come. Let this be our song.
Praise the Lord. Practicing with the kids downstairs, a little bit of a chant. He is big. He's really, really big. He's a whole lot bigger than you think he is. And he's still transforming lives. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, loving God. Oh, how powerful and mighty you are. We are so grateful, and we see you working in the lives of your people, your saints, Lord. We just continue to praise you and bless you, God. It is well with our soul. Thank you, Jesus. In your sweet name we pray, amen. Take an opportunity to, Dieter's going to be out in behind the coffee counter so you can do a social distance uh, Praise the Lord, hallelujah, with him, okay? Go in peace, go in the assurance of his love.